You can come on up. Good morning. Everybody just calm down. I know it's raining. We've had, we've had a lot of activity already this morning and I just can't get over it how God works sometimes and he just throws different things at us and we continue to move forward. I just want to ask you guys to begin just to gather yourselves, relax. You're involved in a church fellowship where this is a safe place. Amen? Amen. We're going to worship God this morning. I want to open up with a word of prayer and I'll introduce our, uh, our special singer this morning and she'll have a little, a little uh, well, a few devotionals to, to talk to you about and then she's going to sing us a couple of songs. But let's just calm down. I'm going to try to calm down too. I drank several cups of coffee this morning, okay? And I do not have my heart monitor on to see what's going on. So let's, let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, God, this morning, Lord, we come into a worship service to honor you, Lord. God, as we continue to see how you unravel in our lives and how your sovereignty is always involved in the minor details, God, we just worship you and we just praise you for that. This morning, God, help us focus on you. Help us, Lord, challenge ourselves with our outlook. How do we see the world? How do we approach people with the gospel, Lord? And are we being a good testimony with the way that we handle ourselves, with the way that we handle others, and the way that we make decisions, God? This morning, Lord, as we lift you up, I just pray that you begin to impact our hearts, that you change lives. God, we love you. This morning, Lord, we come together, and we are a church right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, this is Dave Arnold's daughter. What was your first name again? Jamie, Jamie Reynolds, correct? She's going to sing a couple of songs. Uh, from what I understand, I don't know her. Do you guys know her? Yeah. It's great to be here this morning, and I am very thankful that um, you remember me. <laughs> and because... I was thinking while I was standing up here that I feel very comfortable here. I feel like I'm with family because we're all part of the family of God. So I do feel like I'm with family when I'm here. Um, the song that God put on my heart to sing for you first is called I Am Not Alone. And it's one of my favorite songs um, because it is my testimony. Um, when I sing it, I, I just really I relate to it because... Um, we have a heavenly father who promises that he will never leave us or forsake us. And I've lived long enough now that I know that that is true. I've been a Christian since I was seven years old. And although many times I have strayed from the Lord as I grew in the Lord and then come back, he's always been there ready to welcome me back with open arms. And I see that we have many fathers in the congregation and um, something that God put on my heart he uses past experiences sometimes to teach us things about who he is and the role of a father in a child's life is so important because that child is learning about a father's love and someday they will relate that to their Heavenly Father's love for them and the relationship they have with their Heavenly Father can be very much influenced by how the Father treats the child and loves the child. One of my most vivid memories of my father when I was young is that I used to swim on the swim team. And my dad would, um, when I would race, I would be very nervous. But as soon as I got off of the starting block, and started swimming, I could hear his voice yelling for me and cheering me on and saying, you've almost got it, you've almost got it, you're almost there, you're almost there. And, it, and I knew that he was on my side and that just gave me the confidence to not be nervous and do my best. And um, so many times throughout life, I'll hear the Holy Spirit's voice telling me, you're almost there, you're almost there, you're going to be okay, you're going to be okay. And um, you may not have had an earthly father that loved you that way and was always rooting you on and cheering for you and in your corner, but you do have a heavenly father who will never leave you and is always on your side. And this song is called, I Am Not Alone.
that you will be with me when I'm standing in the fire I will not be overcome going to sing for you is called Thy Will. Some of you may have heard it on the Christian radio station. 
Um, and I don't know if you know the story behind the song, but it's a very touching story, and I thought I would just share that real quickly because um, give you a little bit of insight into the heart of the person who wrote the song. Um, it was written by a woman named Hillary Scott, and she wrote the song after going through a miscarriage. And she was very heartbroken, and God was there to comfort her. And through what she went through, she learned to totally surrender everything to the Lord. The good, the bad, the ugly, everything we go through. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, because God is with us when we are sad. The Bible promises us that. Um, it says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And everything God says is a promise. So we don't have to doubt that. He is close to us whether we feel it or not, we have to believe by faith that he is with us when we're going through hard times. Um, and just like I was able to hear my dad's voice in the screaming crowd of parents cheering for their children, and that's the story I share with you. When we spend time with God on a regular basis, and we don't just go to him when we're going through hard times, but on a daily basis we spend time with him, we will hear his voice when we're going through hard times because we'll know it because we've spent time with him. When we're going through a difficult time in life, we, the devil wants to shout things at us that are um, negative and hurtful and leave us hopeless. And even though those voices from him seem louder at times, if we'll get in our quiet place and spend time with the Lord, he will speak to our heart and he will comfort us. So I hope this song comforts you and encourages you, no matter what you're going through, to surrender it all to him. I'm so confused. My broken heart is a part of your plan. When I try to pray, all I got is hurt and these four words. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. by the noise just trying to make sense of all your promises sometimes i gotta stop remember that you're god and i am not so
Was that for her or me? <laughs> Something I want to open up with, Ephesians chapter 4, about being a church and being in unity. It says this, you don't need to turn there, this is not the sermon, this is just the devotional, okay? So just, just listen to these words. There is one body, one spirit, just as also you were called, in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and is in all. Amen? That's the unity as a church that we have to cling to. That's the unity that we obey by. Being involved in a fellowship, looking out for each other, building each other up. There's no dissension there. It's not coming in and pushing our own agenda. I want to mention our cards. They're in the pews in front of you. If you can, if you're brand new, it's your first time here, uh, this morning's services is just a little different than what we normally run, but that's what's fun about it. Uh, this is our Youth Sunday, and uh, if you want to get connected with us, please fill the connected card out. Leave your information there. You can either have me get a hold of you or one of our deacons get a hold of you. And the other one, uh, and we tend to run out of these here lately, and I love this. Put a prayer request down. You don't have to be specific, but if you are, it helps me get more connected with you. If you need prayer, I'll definitely get it for you. And we'll spread the word to other people because we have prayer warriors within this church. It's just unbelievable. More on that in just a little bit. But first, this idea of worship. I have a devotion I want to read to you from my favorite speaker, one of, uh, Chuck Swindoll. Raise your hand if you know Chuck Swindoll. There we go. All right. I want to read this. And I think some of you know that I've been trying to make an analogy between marbles and church members. Raise your hand if you're aware of that story. Nobody? One person, two? I connected with two of you? Awesome. <laughs> so there's, there was a story that I was approached with uh, years ago in the last church I was at. A former pastor uh, had told a church member, and this pastor had passed away. He told a church member that church is like a container of marbles. And I was like, awesome. I was like, how? And the guy goes, I don't know. I said, well, who, who was the pastor that told you this? Well, he, he's long gone. So it has been haunting me ever since someone told me that story. And I, I have two containers in my office. You can come look at them. Two big glass containers of marbles. And I sit and stare at these marbles and trying to figure it out. And I have no clue what revelation he was given by God of how church members is like marbles. And then I read this, and I don't think this explains it, but this gives me a little bit of a piece to it, and hopefully by the, day, the time I die, I'll figure it out, and I won't share the message, okay? <laughs> but it says here, this is written by Ann Ortlude, uh, by uh, uh, Chuck Swindoll. He used this in one of his sermons. Christians can be grouped into two categories, marbles and grapes. Marbles are single units that don't affect each other except in collision, Okay? Grapes, on the other hand, mingle juices. Each one is a part of the fragrance of the church body. The early Christians didn't bounce around like loose marbles, ricocheting in all directions. Picture them as a cluster of ripe grapes, squeezed together by persecution, bleeding, mingling into one another. Fellowship and worship, then, is genuine Christianity freely shared among God's family members. But it's sad to think of how many Christians today are missing that kind of closeness. It's sad to think of how, how many uh, Christians are missing that connection and not sharing with one another. Sermons and songs, while uplifting and necessary, provide only part of a vital church encounter. We need involvement with others. If we roll in and out of church each week without acquiring a few grape juice stains... We really haven't tasted the sweet wine of fellowship. Isn't that good? Now don't go spitting on each other, okay? <laughs> but what it means is rub off on each other. Before you leave, tell someone that you need some prayer in a certain area. It doesn't show weakness. You know what it shows? It shows that you trust that person to pray for you. That's what that means. There's no such thing as weakness and, and being pathetic. You did that when you accepted Jesus Christ because you realized you were a sinner. And you needed salvation. Amen? Let's pray once again by and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, God, thank you, Lord, to an awesome beginning of a worship service this morning. We are truly blessed, Lord, as people begin to share their gifts before us, as they begin to worship you and honor you, Lord, through outward expressions of the talents that you have given them. Thank you, God, for that. I pray we're blessed once again this morning with music. 
and with the message that's going to be given, Lord. And I pray, as always, that you impact someone with some deep introspection where they can evaluate their own situation before you and confess those sins that hinder an unbelievable, fruitful relationship with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, Brian's took his breath. Let's take ours. Everybody stand up. And are we marbles or grapes? Grapes. Okay. I think some of us are raisins. <laughs> well, we're getting there. All right, leaning on everlasting arms. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you allow us to approach your throne any time, any day, any moment. And Lord, we ask you today to add your blessings to the tithes and offerings that we're about to receive, to bring into the storehouse as you've commanded us to do. And Lord, we pray that each and every one in this congregation today will get a special blessing from the word, from the songs, from everything that's said and done. And we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
morning. I'll tell you, as I stand here today, I have to give the good Lord all my thanks. Everything I have goes to him. I also want to thank the church for the stair lift that we have for people who cannot take steps. It is a blessing for me because when I get just a little bit better, I'll be back in the choir. And today, I rode the stair lift up here so that I don't have to stand in the middle of the floor for you when I sing. It is a blessing for the church to do this for handicapped people. Uh, I also want to thank the church for the beautiful flowers I received and for all of the beautiful and wonderful cards that I received at home after I got home. And for some of the people who came to Health South and saw me, it was a blessing. And you don't know how cards make a day when you're having a bad day, especially recovering from surgery. And a beautiful card comes and you read it and you smile and you sit there and read it again. It is wonderful. I could not have came to a better church to call my own, but it is our church. And of course, we have a new pastor. Of course, I still call him new. And you know, he is wonderful. He is great. And he calls me, he visited me. I've seen him before when I was in the hospital. But what I am going to sing today just says everything from my heart to my Lord. And I think that it will reflect on a lot of you. And I hope you get something from this song because it's one of my favorite songs to sing to my Lord. And after having this surgery that I went through, I have to say, this is the song I had to sing today. And that is, thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Because without him, I wouldn't have a thing. He has given me everything. And especially through this surgery. I just can't believe how well I'm doing and going. The good Lord was with the doctor, and I told him, I said, you know, you're a good surgeon, but you're not the greatest. I said, my heavenly Father up above is the one I have to thank. So I say amen to that, because that's the truth. So, okay, we'll try this song for you today. on me as I travel along and they say I have nothing but they are so wrong in my heart I'm rejoicing now I wish they could see thank you Lord for your blessings on me There's a roof up above me I've a good place to sleep There's food on my table Shoes on my feet You gave me your love, Lord And a fine family Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. 
blessings on me. And these clothes are not new And I don't have much money But Lord, I have you And to me, that's all that matters Though the world may not see Thank you, Lord your blessings on me. There's a roof up above me. I've a good place to sleep. There's food on my table, shoes on my feet. You gave me your love, Lord. And a fine family Thank you, Lord For your blessings on me Thank you, Lord For your blessings on me Turn me on. There we go. Isn't she a blessing? If you, uh, if you ever have an inclination in, onto the idea of trying to figure out how to create boldness in your life to present the gospel and, and present your testimony, go hang out with Patty. Honestly. If you're a roommate with her and, uh, at Health South or at the hospital, you're going to hear the gospel message, but then you're going to want her to continue to pray for you after you leave. And that's what she's done. She develops relationships and she does that way. Now, folks, I think we're extremely blessed here at Pine Grove. And you already know this. We got several retired ministers that are in the congregation that help out with many, many, many things. We got uh, very good and gifted teachers. We have Coach Lathy doing his Revelation series on Sunday night. So it's the second night will be tonight. We have a group coming next Sunday night to, to worship in music, Forever Blessed. Okay, we have VBS starting tomorrow, and you need to be in prayer about VBS, but also understand, if you're at home sitting on your tail watching TV, I'm going to find out who you are, and I'm going to come ask you, why are you sitting at home when you could be here suffering the rest of us? I say suffering, listen, you get involved with kids, and you, you come and help Donna, and you come and help Krista out as they pour into this VBS stuff, you're going to see how much talent this church actually truly has. You've got to get behind that stuff. And something else that uh, I have noticed here, uh, you have beside me uh, Chris Hackney, who has been called to the ministry several years ago. How long have you been at Liberty University now? About two years. He's been at Liberty University for two years online, and me and him constantly pour into each other. And uh, I still teach for Liberty University, so when we get together and we start talking about things that are in common, we find we, we talk about uh, too many things, random things, and we end up talking for close to two hours oh, yeah. at, at every given time. So before we go into a conversation, we make sure that Cassie has nothing to do and that my wife has nothing to do uh, because, you know, iron sharpens iron. And something I wish somebody would have done early on in my career as far as being called to the ministry was give me an opportunity to preach. I only had one opportunity to preach before I became a pastor. And I developed as a pastor uh, at the last church a little more. And I know some of you are keeping notes. I got a long way to go. I get it. Okay. <laughs> and we're brushing up on that. But just remember, folks, we need to get behind each other, including this right here. Let's listen to what God has given him to say uh, and give him the same attention. Give him better attention that, <laughs> than what you give me on a Sunday morning. So, Chris Hackney, thank you, brother. All right. Thanks, Brian. Uh, good morning, everybody. Am I on? Okay. All right. Um, I just want to ask you a question this morning and think about it. And what type of glasses did you put on today? Now, a lot of you may be thinking that I didn't put any glasses on today. I'm, I think I have perfect vision. Well, a lot of us think that. But ever since I was 12 years old, 
I discovered that you know, I couldn't see very well. So a lot of times you may see me and I may be in contacts or I may have, you know, I may see Steve at work and I may be in a pair of safety glasses. But every day we need to realize that there's a set of glasses that we put on. Um, when I wanted uh, to see better at school, you know, I went and told my mom, I was like, I can't, I can't see the chalkboard very well. And I wanted to do well in school. However, she thought I just wanted to be like the rest of the kids in the class that had glasses. Now, I don't know about any of you, but if you were ever in school and you had to wear glasses, that wasn't a thing that you wanted to have, right? No. So I ended up with glasses all throughout school, and they're not very comfortable. They um, you know, slide off your face. They get fogged up when you go outside. But there's one thing that they do do for me, and that is to allow me to see the world better, right? So I can read with them. And you may be getting to the age where you have to ask yourself, I may need glasses. You know, we were up here this morning and there was five or six of us gathered that uh, prayed before we started for the uh, worship service like we normally do. And I noticed that one of us didn't have glasses. However, I'm wearing his shirt because he gave it to me and I'm wondering, I'm thinking, maybe he needed to wear some glasses when he was picking this out. <laughs> but all of us need to recognize that we have some blindness in our life and whether we recognize it early or we recognize it later in life, there's a set of glasses that we put on every day. And it's, you know, I discovered this when I was around um, 14 and that set of glasses is that there's a difference in what the world presents to us and there's a difference in what God wants us to see so when I accepted that that began a change in my life and I began to see the world a little bit differently we look at the world and we start to see the hurt in the world we start to see where we need to have compassion for other people we need to see the love that God has for the, rest, for the rest of us. So you may have noticed these things as well. You may notice that there are people that have left your life and that has caused hurt and pain and discomfort with you. And you want to know why. And you may have never answered that question for yourself. You may be young and you look at your parents and wonder, you know, why, why did they split up? What, what caused this pain and this uh, suffering that's in the world? And when we don't answer that for each other and we don't look to the Bible for the answers, then all we do is remain blinded in spiritual blindness. And that blindness causes us to lead life in darkness. So what we want to do is come to the light, right? We want to be able to see. We want to put God's lenses on. So, God does not want us to remain blind, right? He wants us to, He didn't create us to live in darkness and to live with suffering and this pain and this blindness forever. He, he's offered an opportunity for us. So, let's turn to Mark chapter 8, verses uh, 13 through 26. And we'll see what the Bible has to say about uh, the blindness. It says, Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, It is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember, when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven. 
He said to them, do you still not understand? And then immediately afterwards, he gives them a demonstration. So they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside of the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes, then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, Don't go into the village. All right, so here we have a passage where Jesus has not... Um, you know, he's teaching the disciples and he's getting ready to go into Jerusalem. This is right before he goes into Jerusalem and suffers the, his passion and, and redeems us. And this is right before he asks the disciples to tell him who he is. And then Peter makes the confession that he is the Son of God, right? So at this point in time, when he asks the disciples this, the disciples are still unaware and how many times are we shown things in our lives where we are still unaware? I mean, they have just seen twice now the teaching or the healing of, or the feeding of the uh, 5,000 and 4,000, right? And he asked them the, the basketfuls of bread. Like, what, what does this mean? Well, the 12 is for the 12 tribes of Israel. You know, he is the savior for them and then also of the Gentile nation. That is the leftover baskets uh, for the Gentiles. So he is the savior of all of us. And that's what he is trying to explain for, to the disciples. But they still don't see and they still don't understand. And he quotes Isaiah when he um, asks them that, you know, do you have eyes but you do not see? Do you have hear, ears and you still not understand? So there's many times in our lives where we remain spiritually blind. And without Jesus coming to us and asking us these things, and He does this by members of the church. He does this by our compassion and our hand reached out as His hand. And unless we do that for other people, then they will never come to understand that Jesus is always reaching out His hand to restore our sight. And then afterwards, um, I want to talk about the, uh, the blind man. This is the only passage where Jesus does a healing that takes more than one touch. All of the other touches that he does when he heals somebody is immediate. And it's for our benefit as well as for the disciples' benefit to understand that our healing is not always immediate when it comes to spiritual sight. A lot of times we are left without complete understanding. And we won't have that complete understanding until we are with Him. All of our answers will be answered, right? And um, Jamie mentioned that uh, Satan throws things at us, right? And 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that Satan has the uh, power to blind the minds of unbelievers to the gospel, that is Jesus Christ, unto salvation. So if we are combating against Satan, and we never reach out and grab Jesus' hand when He is trying to restore our sight, then we are left to remain blind. Now that goes for unbelievers, and that goes for believers as well. If there's any sin that is in your life that is preventing you from you know, being restored, the blind man, he, he admitted to Jesus, he's like, I still don't see clearly, right? So this is a, that progressive healing where we need to come more, than, more often. Now, your justification is immediate where you're saved, but we may not understand fully until we come to Him and ask Him to restore our sight. So, this is why I ask you, you know, what glasses did you put on today? Did you wake up and put the world lenses on that you're familiar with? Or daily, do you wake up and say, what does God want me to do today? And how am I going to impact my community? Am I going to look on my neighbor with the lenses that I always do and pass judgment? Or am I going to try to see them the way that God sees them and love them, pray for them, and extend a hand of compassion towards your family, your friends, the person in the church that may have made you mad last week? Um, whatever it may be, 
to bring us closer together is what we need to view the world through. So those lenses are the ones that need to replace our own lenses. Now many times I'll wake up and halfway through my day I'll realize I've got the wrong glasses on, you know? And many times, you know, I don't know if Steve, if he's ever done this, but I'll go out into the unit and realize I've got my regular glasses on because they're better for watching the computer, they're better for reading, and I forgot to switch out and put my safety glasses on. And that's probably not a good thing because we can probably get in trouble for those type of things. But uh, if you really sit back and ask yourself, you know, how am I viewing the world? And realize that the only way that you can view the world correctly is by Jesus Christ, okay? So in this, in this example here, later he goes through and says that, um, you know, he asked Peter to uh, claim who he is. And, he, and Peter says that he's the uh, son of God, but he doesn't fully understand to the extent that that means. And then on the road back from the resurrection, he fully awakens the disciples' eyes so that they can go into the world. So we see this progressiveness throughout the New Testament and throughout the Gospels that says that we need to always come to Jesus, always come back to Him, no matter if you're an unbeliever and you've never accepted Him for the first time, or you have been a Christian for 45 years or 50 years or 60 years. Um, whatever that may be, then we always need to come back because there's always a new generation that is growing up that needs to come to Jesus and realize that He is our salvation. So just think about that and think about how we are mentoring and discipling other people. If we notice that they are faltering, can we just ask them to you know, check their lenses? Hey, do you have the right set of glasses on today? Um, and whether you've never had glasses before, then maybe that might be a uh, hard um, illustration for you. But I don't know if you went outside and you put some sunglasses on so that you're not blinded, right? Um, most of us have put some type of lenses on to protect our eyes or, or help us see the world better. So that's what I'm asking you this morning is, what set of glasses do you put on every day? Which ones are uh, you going to view your neighbors with, your friends with, and see the hurt that is in the world and see the, uh, the pain and suffering? And realize that the thing that keeps that there is the sin that's in the world, and the sin that may be in your own life, the sin that is in their life, and the only way to remove it is to have that touch of Jesus in your life. And the way to do that is that you need to ask Him to remove that spiritual blindness. And the only way to do that is to ask for repentance of um, your sins, and then He will remove that. And then come to Him daily, and that way He can guide you along that path. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't leave you as soon as you do that. He's going to grab your hand and lead you out of that darkness into the light. So we don't want to leave you here today without making sure that you understand that there is a way out of that. So if you've never done that before, you know, we would like to extend that invitation to make sure that you, um, that you do that. So... I guess I could have. We'll have you guys come forward and begin to play the invitation. I'm going to have Chris and I stand down here. And everybody please stand as Ron comes up and leads us in an invitation. And as far as what you've heard this morning, guys, what Chris was saying is, is having that vision. Try not to have a filtered view uh, on people where we put... We put certain circumstances on folks, and I've used this a lot as me as, as your pastor, as I stand before you in a pair of jeans, a polo shirt, and my chucks. For a lot of you, that doesn't fit the image of a pastor. But what is it about clothing that changes your view about pastors? I had an opportunity to do an interview when I was at WVU several years ago, and when I showed up for the interview, I didn't own a tie. And when I didn't have the tie, the girl turned me away and said, you can't do an interview without the tie. 
And I said, ma'am, I'm, I'm, I'm looking in and seeing her workers, and it looked like pajama day, you know? And I said, uh, I'm not coming back because the answers to your questions aren't going to change because I put a tie on. God equips you. God prepares you for who you are, not for anything else. He doesn't prepare you for someone else's work. He prepares you for the work that is before you. The only way you're going to know what that work is, listening, being guided, like Chris said, the Holy Spirit will take you by the hand and he will guide you along the way that he knows you need to go into. But the only way to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, you better be having Bible study. You better have prayer time. You better have some fellowship. You better be sharpening each other, encouraging each other. Find a church where you can get involved in, not simply showing up for 30 minutes on a Sunday and then going home. That's not fellowship. You have a country club you attend. Get involved. When you use those gifts, we had uh, an opening with uh, amazing songs who was completely gifted and talented by God. Patty as well, gifted and talented by God. Chris, well on his way to begin his ministry, talented and gifted by God, okay? The only way that you feel God being pleased with you is if you do what you've seen this morning. Find out what yours is. Begin to please God through the way that you serve him. I'm going to say one small little prayer, then Ron's going to lead us through. If you want prayer, Chris and I will stand here. If you want prayer with us, we'll pray with you. If you want prayer along the invitation area here, you come up and pray, and I guarantee you're going to have the believers, your family, your support surround you and pray with you. They don't need to know what it is. Just bring it up here and begin to pray about it. Close your eyes. I want to pray. Heavenly Father God, thank you, Lord, for this morning's message. Thank you, God, that you have given Chris this insight into this scripture of how Jesus was trying to get them to see past the flesh past this filtered view, Lord, that they placed on each other, that they couldn't really see that the gospel message would be extended far beyond what they understood it would go. God, thank you that we have these uh, historical documents to reflect on and, and see the interactions that you had with your disciples as we begin to encourage one another, God. And as those folks that are in here who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray you convict them in a way that the boldness within them grows and they say, this morning is the morning I'm going to accept Jesus into my life. This morning is the morning I'm going to change my path. And it only happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. And God will have a will that will be laid out before you. And you will never be confused. You will never be left alone. For he never leaves us nor forsakes us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have thine own way, Lord.
to thank you guys for coming this morning. Please stick around for Sunday school class if you can. There are decorations downstairs, so be careful. It'll look, oh, uh, Cassie said don't touch. Uh, but do, do what you can to get your Sunday school class lesson taken care of. Uh, it is manageable and it is doable. Uh, and please uh, just understand we're going to have a great week this week with VBS. Uh, be in prayer for that. But also if you want to get involved, it is not too late. It is never too late. All right. It's like the gospel message. It's never too late. Okay. So I'm going to close in prayer. And as you leave, folks, uh, those of you that may be going on your way, I'm going to stand back there with Chris as well. Um, let him know what it's like to be a pastor. As you leave the service, <laughs> whether or not you're happy or not with him, okay? No, you know what you need to do. You need to, edification is the, uh, the word for the day. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you, Lord, for a wonderful service this morning. Thank you, God, of all the people that have been involved. Thank you, Lord, for the gifts and the talents that were on display. And God, it was all to glorify you. We lift you up, Lord, the foundation of our teaching, our preaching, and our reaching. And the fact that we are involved is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I ask that you embold those that are here in the here this morning when they go out that they have courage to proclaim the gospel at every turn and every situation that they have within the mission field. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for the blessing of this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. And in the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. When the solid ground is falling out from underneath my feet. Between the black skies and my red eyes, I can barely see. When I realize I've been sold out by my friends and my family, I can feel the rain reminding me. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. Surrounds me in the eye of the storm. When my hopes and dreams are far from me and I'm running out of faith, I see the future I picture slowly fade away. And when the tears of pain and heartache are pouring down my face, I find my peace in Jesus' name. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, 